All right, so we are still in day six, and uh, Tracy's put together some fantastic ideas today. And uh, I don't know, did you want to read anything um, from Genesis 1 to kick things off? Or is there something specific you want to start with? Um, we're still going to just focus on this idea of the number six. The man and beast being created on the same day. The being made in the image or likeness of Elohim, but having the um, the opposite to that is taking on this image of a beast and we're going to see how the scriptures teach us about this and that yes we have this um literal way of reading day six but we're delving into the spiritual matters that are throughout the scriptures as it relates to this day and remember that a day is as a thousand years a thousand years is as a day and so we are looking at this in a much broader sense from Genesis to Revelation in regards to the sixth day and what it might mean for us. So we're gonna start looking at some more of those differences between the image or mark of Elohim versus the image or mark of a beast. And as I say that, you're probably familiar with Revelation, this mark of the beast. So we're gonna actually be talking a little bit about that today. All right, so I also want you to kind of keep in mind this number six as we go through and how it kind of comes to surface. The scriptures speak about how Elohim places his name upon those who belong to him. So he kind of marks us out, seals us with this name. And one place we can read about that is in Numbers 6. When he's speaking to um, the priests and saying, this is how you're going to bless my people. And this is how you're going to place my name upon my people. So number 6, 22 through 27. And Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and to his sons saying, in this way, you shall bless the sons of Israel. Saying to them, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahovah make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahovah lift up his face to you and give you peace. And they shall put my name upon the sons of Israel, and I will bless them. Can we hear it in Hebrew? So is... Okay. Um, well, let me just say this. Everybody here, I think, unless you object, um, want to be called by the name of the Lord. You have a desire to serve him. So I will pray this prayer over you right now. And in Hebrew, it goes like this. Iverechecha Yahovah vayishmerecha, Ya'er Yahovah panava lecha v'yichunecha, Yisa Yahovah panava lecha v'yasem lecha shalom. So this is how you shall put my name upon my people. So we are called by his name. And we know that Messiah came in his father's name. He came into the earth in his father's name. And he told us, Yahovah told us, he's going to send us this prophet. And he's going to have his name in him. He's going to come in my name. So we're going to talk about what that means. So if we've agreed to enter into covenant with Elohim, then we are agreeing to represent him in the earth, taking his name upon us. Let's go over to Exodus 20, verse 7. Exodus 20, that's where we see find the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words. And these are some of the terms of this covenant, if you agree to serve Yahovah. And we're all familiar with this command. You shall not take the name of Yahovah your God in vain. For Yahovah will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. So in other words, he will be guilty 
if he takes the name in vain. Now we were all, pretty much all of us, were raised to believe that this means don't say his name in a negative way. And, you know, the world does that. They've taken his name and made it into a curse word and, and all that stuff. Or if you hear somebody say, oh my God, you're like, don't take the name in vain. That's not what this means. Of course, we shouldn't take just throw his name around willy-nilly. And I believe it's for that reason that not many people truly know his name. He's hidden it. He's kept it protected. He's sealed it among his people. But let's look at this word take in Hebrew. You shall not nasa the name of Yahovah, your Elohim, in vain. You shall not lift it. Uh, so you're, this idea of bearing it up, carrying it. Um, let's go down a little bit more. It says something about marry, receive, wear it. So this nasa is also used several places that just talk about lifting up or carrying. So if he's placing his name upon you, and you are taking it upon you, you are carrying his name in your head, in your hand, in your whole being, in your heart. Just as a marriage covenant where, you know, a man and woman get married, the woman takes the name of the husband. Similar idea. You enter into a covenant with Yahovah, you are agreeing to take his name upon you in that you are now representing him in the earth. Don't do that in vain. Um, let's look at the word vain while we're here. Hebrew word shav, the sense of desolating, evil, ruin, um, especially guile, idolatry, uselessness, Vanity, lying, emptiness. So these are. this is what he's saying. Don't take my name upon you. Don't agree to represent me in the earth and then commit idolatry against me um, or present my name falsely, presenting me in a lying way. Emptiness, worthlessness. These are not things that define our... Elohim or his character or his name. So now if you've agreed to take his name upon you, that is a big job and you better take it seriously. Now, when uh, Yahovah entered into this covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai, it was like a marriage covenant. And they said, all that he said, we will do. So now we can see taking the name upon us has to do with doing what he said to do. So if I say I serve Yahovah, yet I go out and deny him by not obeying Yahovah and his words that he has written to us, I'm taking his name in vain. I'm representing him falsely. Um, I have a verse that I didn't give you, Mike, if you could just pull up Jeremiah 15, 16 for me. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and gladness of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Yahovah, the God of hosts, the Elohim of hosts. So now we can see a connection to finding his word, eating them, that is, taking them into us internally in our inner man and being called by his name. So some more ways we can take his name in vain, like we said, by claiming to represent him, but denying him by the things we do. By claiming that we serve the living God, but denying him but not, by not obeying the words of the living God that he has appointed for us. Messiah speaks about this in Matthew 7. 
Matthew 7, 6 through 13. Mm -hmm. did, I, did I write that right? I don't think that's supposed to be in here. Oh. Can we scroll down? I might have just put the wrong verse in there. No, scroll down in Matthew 7, I'm sorry. All right. Um, Keith, could I get you to look up the verse for me um, where Messiah tells us that um, we worship him in vain? by keeping the traditions of men and then we'll go ahead and and skip up to matthew 10. so matthew 10 32 through 33 sorry i thought i knew where that was i thought it was maybe luke Six or no, seven. and I, I, I thought I, I don't, I don't know what I did. I, sorry about that, guys. Keith, are you here? Yeah, I just had to. I was working on fixing my screen and audio problems, but here, let me try to look. Okay. That up. It is Matthew fifteen. Maybe I put that somewhere else, but let's go to Matthew 15. Talking about worshiping in vain. Verse, let's see, let's start here. Um, the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Yehoshua saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him die by death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever you would gain from me, it is a gift to God. And in no way he honors his father or his mother. And you voided the commandment of God by your traditions. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draws near to me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So here's an example. You may say you are serving God. You may have said, I take his name, but... Your, vain, your worship becomes vain when you make void his commands and the things he told you to do, keeping the words of another instead. You're elevating the words of man over the words of God, thus making void, empty, the words of God. Okay, so now let's go over to Matthew 10.32. And he says here, 1032 through 33, there it is. Then everyone who shall confess me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Now we... In, Take this going, yes, uh, I believe in Jesus. I confess his name. But we're learning his name is more than just words that we utter. His name is his character. His name is his authority. His name is his word. And we have agreed to serve him by taking on that name and performing it in the earth and representing him in the earth. So he's saying... Whoever shall deny me before man, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. How do we deny him? Titus 1.16 gives us a good answer. 
remember we draw near with the mouth, but our hearts are far from him. It says they profess that they know God, but in their works, they deny him being abominable and disobedient and reprobate to every good work. So if we proclaim that we know him, but don't do what he says, we are actually denying him. We are denying his name. Let's go over to Revelation 3, 7 through 13. This is the one of the uh, letters to one of the churches, the called out ones, happens to be to the church of Philadelphia, the sixth church. And let's see what Messiah says to this sixth church. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens, says these things. I know your works. Behold, I have given before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Again, we see the connection between his word and his name. Behold, I give out of those of the synagogue of Satan, those saying themselves to be Jews, and are not, but lie, remember taking the name in vain, presenting it as a lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my patience. I also will keep you from the hour of temptation which will come upon the habitable world to try those who dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go out no more. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So let's sum up here. We've got the word being connected to his name. Keeping his name is keeping his word. And then we have this idea of holding fast to him, like we talked about before, this wrestling. We're either going to wrestle and give in to the flesh, that beast nature, or we're going to hold fast to the spirit and hold fast to the Messiah and his words and overcome by him and through him. And if and when we overcome, He's going to write his name on us and the city, the new Jerusalem. So let's keep that in mind as we proceed. Again, this is to the sixth church. And he speaks here to the sixth church also about those who are masquerading as his. And he calls them out of the synagogue of Satan. Those who are truly his have been marked with his name. And we're going to look at that, some specific examples of that in Revelation. Let's look at Revelation 7, 2 through 10. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, do not hurt the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 having been sealed out of every tribe of the sons of Israel. I'm not going to read all of them, but this is the him listing those who are sealed out of these tribes of Israel. And let's skip down to verse 9. After these things I looked, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, out of all the nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God sitting on the throne and to the Lamb. So I'm not going to like dissect this much, but we see that there are 144,000 
these are individuals of the tribes of Israel who are sealed with this seal of God. But then verse 9 speaks about a great multitude which no one could number out of all the nations of all the earth, and they're wearing white robes. Um, we remember that in day five of our study, we read Yehoshua's words to the fifth church, and that those who overcome, he said, would be worthy to walk with him in white. So we see that these individuals are in white. So let's just pause for a moment and mention again the Day of Atonement, which we're not going to get to today, but it's it applies here. Yom Kippur is the sixth feast, which corresponds to the sixth day of creation, where traditionally our Jewish brethren wear white on this day. And perhaps now we can see why. There's lots of things that are kind of leading us to that in these scriptures that we're reading. The Day of Atonement is the appointed time when Yahovah, um, of Yahovah that is associated with mankind's ultimate judgment, which we'll learn more about later. So to the fifth church, he says, to those who overcome, you'll be worthy to walk with me in white. He is essentially pronouncing innocence upon them. I remember what we read back um, in Exodus 20, those who take his name in vain, he will not hold guiltless. So we have this idea of guilt and innocence. And white uh, represents innocence. So we can probably deduce that maybe black represents guilt. It's just a thought I had because uh, I've heard that that was one way that they cast lots and perhaps the Urim and the Thummim um, back in the, the priest, priestly days when they would cast lots or ask God question. They would get out this thing called the Urim and the Thummim. It's, pro it's, it's hypothesized that they were black and white stones. Um, and then there's another place in um, the scriptures when in Revelation, when he's talking to one of the churches, he says, I will give you a white stone with a new name on it. So just keeping in mind this white representing innocence being pronounced innocent. All right, so we are in Revelation 7 still. Let's look at this word, seal. It's G4972, um, toward the top there. Probably all of those are the same word. This is the sealer mark of Elohim. And it uh, says to stamp with a signet or a private mark for security or preservation, to keep secret, to seal up, to stop. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Seal it up. This is the king's signet, his stamp on you, his mark on you. And we looked at that Hebrew word for um, sign or mark. And uh, last time, I believe, maybe the time before, which was oath. And um, that'll come up again as well. So let's go ahead and flip over to Revelation 14, 1 through 13, and see what else we can learn about this mark, this seal. And I looked and lo, the Lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him were a hundred and forty-four thousands, having his Father's name written in their foreheads. Okay, so that hundred and forty-four thousand corresponds to chapter 7, when they were sealed in the forehead. And now it's telling us it's the Father's name written in their foreheads. So we can conclude that the seal, the mark, the seal of God, in the forehead is his name going on and i heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of a great thunder and i heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps and they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders and no one could learn that song except the four hundred and forty-four thousands who were redeemed from the earth 
These are those who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men as a first fruit to God and to the Lamb. So pause a minute. Now we can see the 144,000. That's not everybody who's ever going to be saved. It's telling us it's their first fruits. And we've learned that that's like the first and best. Because then we read later that there was a great multitude that nobody could number. So keep that in mind. Um, moving on, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they were without blemish before the throne. This idea of being washed clean, we talked about the washing of the water of the word. We see this no guile in their mouth. There's no untrue thing. So they must have God's words in their mouth. Verse 6, And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those dwelling on the earth, even to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a great voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And another angel followed, saying, The great city Babylon has fallen, has fallen because of the wine of the anger of her fornication she had made all nations to drink so let's pause again we have a city new jerusalem pronounced innocent name of god written on the forehead uh white garments we'll come back to that we'll see some more scripture about that but i want to pull out this great another city another great city this one's called babylon and we talked last time about daniel in Daniel 2, about this great image that the king of Babylon set up, the head of gold, which was a representation of the king of Babylon associated with Satan himself being the ruler of these man-made kingdoms. Babylon meaning confusion by mixing. Satan's MO is to cause God's people to curse themselves, to become confused by mixing God's words with another's. Isn't that what we said? Don't take his name in vain by mixing man's traditions with God's words. Because by doing so, you're denying him by your actions. Okay, continuing on. And a third angel followed them, saying with a great voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark in his forehead, or in his hand, so now we have another mark in the forehead, he will also drink of the wine of the anger of God, having been mixed undiluted in the cup of his wrath, and he will be tormented by fire and brimstone before the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their to torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night those who worship the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. Oh, there's another connection. We've got a beast, we've got an image, and we've got his name in the forehead or in the hand. It's a counterfeit. Okay, so now we've got two different marks. So let's keep that in mind. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are the ones who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yehoshua. This, these two thoughts are very important here. We're going to come back to those again. Those who keep the commands and have the faith and the witness, the testimony, if you will, of Yehoshua. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they shall rest from their labors and their works follow them. Okay? I think I may have addressed all this stuff here. Um, Keith, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, the, the fact that he's pointing out that the difference there between the, the mark and then, you know, this thing about the rapture, yet I just heard you say the 144,000 are going to be the first fruits and they're all Jews. 
I thought there I was a rapture. That. Huh? <laughs> Israel. I didn't say Jews. Well, I'm sorry. It was Mark. It said before in the verse before it said that they were, it says Jews, but it's Yehud, Yehudim uh, mm -hmm. were the 144,000 in the, before you came over to this part of Revelation. So this uh, idea that they are the first fruits is very interesting. Yeah, I'm not going to get into it just because I don't really know exactly what it means, but um, the concept is there have been some people that, that Yahweh set aside and gave his words as a light to the nations. So there had to have been a core remnant of people who had his words in order to spread that to the nations to draw all men to himself. So I'll just leave it at that. All right, so we've talked about another mark, the mark of the beast, and we'll talk more about that. And we talked about Daniel's image in Daniel 2, not Daniel's image, but um, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had where he set up this image of a man in his own likeness with Babylon call, being called a sort of king of kings at its head. And we compared that to a sort of anti-Messiah with Satan at its head. Mike, I do have another verse for you to pull up really quick. Daniel chapter 3. Verse 1. This is interesting because Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. Daniel interprets it through the Spirit of God. And then in the very next chapter, Nebuchadnezzar decides to make an, an image. Nebuchadnezzar the king, king of Babylon, made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits so now we're dealing in multiples of six again he set it up in the plain of dura in the province of babylon then nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together satraps the prefects the governors the counselors the treasurers the judges the justices and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which nebuchadnezzar the king had set up then were gathered the all of those people that i just mentioned and to the dedication of the image of that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up then a herald cried aloud to you it's commanded O people nations and languages at the time you hear the sound of the horn the pipe the zither the lyre harp bagpipe and all kinds of music you shall fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up and whoever does not fall down and worship at that moment, they will be thrown into the middle of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the zither, the lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, the nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now, we, if you're familiar with this story, you know that there were three individuals, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their Hebrew names, you may know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They refused to worship the image of a man. This golden image in these um, intervals of six with Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, at its head. They refused to bow, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. But then we see that there was one like the Son of Man that was in the furnace with them. So three men went in, but behold, there were four. Remember Messiah being that number four, that number four representing that, that messianic figure that we talked about on day four. So when we refuse to worship the image of, I'm going to say the beast, this image of man, there is one that goes with you and protects you and is with you in the fire. Let's flip over to Acts 17. Acts 17, 22 through 31. 
I thought this was an interesting passage that related to this. And standing in the middle of the Areopagus, I'm sure you say that, Paul said, Men, Athenians, I see that you are fearful of gods in everything. For as I passed by and saw the things you worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Not knowing then whom you worship, I make him known to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is served with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives life and breath and all things to all. And he has made all nations of men of one blood to dwell on all the face of the earth, ordaining four appointed seasons and boundaries, boundaries of their dwelling to seek the Lord, if perhaps they might feel after him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As also certain of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Then being offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like gold or silver or stone engraved by art and man's imagination. Truly then, overlooking the times of ignorance, now he strictly commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed, having given proof to all by raising him from the dead. Okay, so Paul's making this connection to these false gods, these false images that man sets up, and saying that that's not what our God is like. He, We are made in his image. All right, so now we're going to go over to Revelation 22, 1 through 5. And look more again at the seal or mark of Elohim. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of its street and of the river from here and from there was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each yielding its fruit according to one month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And every curse will no longer be, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be in their foreheads. And there will be no need, be no night there, and they need no lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Remember the name of Israel we looked at in Hebrew, meaning to rule with God. And we see that they will see his face. Remember what we read in the beginning. The blessing of placing the name of Yahweh upon you. May his face shine upon you was one of the lines. So they will see his face. And his name will be in their foreheads. And they are called his servants because they serve him. Now recall what we learned previously. That he has a name which no one knows except himself. We talked about it being this wonderful name. It is too wonderful for you because his name is his word. It is the word of God. And we learn from John 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Revelation 19, 13, he was clothed in a robe dipped in blood. He comes to make war and judge and his name is called the Word of God. Okay, so what does this imply? I was thinking about, and this is actually Ella brought this to my attention. We were studying something else in scripture, but there's this property that we learned about in geometry called the transitive property of equality. So Mike's got this pulled up for me. It's a form of deductive reasoning that says if two values are equal and either of those two values is equal to a third value, then all the values must be equal. 
It's a pretty common sense thing, but it's a way to apply this deductive reasoning. And this can be expressed as where A, B, and C are the variables that re represent the same number. We see if A equals B, and I've color coded them here, and B equals C, then A must e also equal C. And we can do this by plugging in a number. So I, I plugged in the number one, trying to keep with our theme of unity and echad, that if, uh, let's say, C equals one. If C equals one, then what are the values of A and B? By plugging in C equals one, we know that C equals B, so B equals one. Then we can plug one into the first equation, A equals B, to find that A equals one as well. So therefore, A equals B equals C, one. It is echad, okay? Hopefully that's not too confusing. But I want to see if we can, go ahead, Keith. How about if we use, like, if Yahovah equals truth for A and B, and then we know uh, truth equals C, Yeshua, then Yahovah equals Yeshua. The roof of Shem. <laughs> That's awesome. I think we can apply this in several ways. Like I said, when Ella and I were, when she brought this up, we were talking about something else. But it's, 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 it's a logical way of looking at it. And so what I want to do is see if we can apply that, the same reasoning with the seal of Elohim. So let's say A is the seal of Elohim. B is the name of Elohim, and C is the word of Elohim. If the seal of Elohim in the foreheads of his servants is his name, which that's what the scripture said, his name in the forehead of his servants, and the name of Elohim is his word, because that's what the scripture says, then we can deduce that the seal of Elohim in the foreheads of his servants is the word of Elohim in the foreheads of his servants. Does scripture support this idea? It certainly does. Let's look at a few of them. Exodus 13, 6 through 10. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to Yahovah. Of an unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no leavened bread seen with, it with you, and there shall be no leaven seen with you in all your borders. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is because of what Yahovah did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be a sign to you upon your hand and for a memorial between your eyes. All right, so that's that word oath, word sign. And now we're seeing it being something that's on the forehead and in the hand. Why? That Yahovah's Torah may be in your mouth, for the Lord has brought you out of Egypt with a strong hand. Okay, so we're seeing a mark or a sign in your hand and forehead as it pertains to his words being in your mouth. And didn't it say in Revelation somewhere that we read there was no guile found in their mouths? Okay, so there's an idea of a mark of some sort of sign in the forehead. Let's go on to the next one. Exodus 16. We're making the connection to his name, his seal, and his word on his people. We're going to read verses 4 and 5 and then skip down to 26 to 28. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from the heavens for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain amount every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my Torah or not. And on the sixth day it shall happen. They shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather day by day. So again, we see the number six, the sixth day, and um, God sending his people out to gather manna, and his manna representing his word. In fact, when it says, I will go out 
tell them to go out and gather a certain amount or a certain rate in the Hebrew, that word is devar, which is the Hebrew word word. So it's essentially saying, go out and gather my word for six days, if we were to read it according to the Spirit. And on the seventh day, there's not going to be any. And why am I doing this? To test you to see whether you will walk in my Torah or not for six days. Here's that word devar. Gather a certain word each day. So the spiritual meaning is, is showing up here. Are we going to do what he said or not? And then skipping down to verse 26. 26 to 28. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there shall be none. And it happened some of the people went out on the seventh day in order to gather, and they did not find any. This, if you're familiar with the parable of the ten virgins, this should sound kind of familiar, sounds similar, that some went out to try to get oil for the lamps, but it was too late at that time. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. And then in verse 28, Yahovah said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my Torah? Okay, so this is a sign. This is a, a sign of sixes, the six days that we are given as an opportunity to serve the living God. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Looking for the mark, looking for the seal of God in the forehead. Hear, O Israel, Yahovah our Elohim is Echad. Yahovah is Echad. He is one. You shall love Yahovah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your might. And these words which I shall command you this day shall be in your heart. And you shall carefully teach them to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes you shall write them on the posts of your house and on your gates okay and then we're going to go to deuteronomy uh, 11 18 and 19. therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your hearts and in your souls and bind them for a sign upon your hand so that they may be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall teach them to your sons speaking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up so this is these words shall be in your mouth isaiah 8:16 talking about sealing and his word and his name. Here it says, bind up the testimony, seal the Torah among my disciples. So now his Torah is like a seal on his taught ones. Remember, those who have heard and learned from the Father will come to the Messiah, and we will become disciples of him, disciples of the word of God. And now keep, pay attention to these two words, the testimony and the law, the law and the testimony. Uh, let's skip down to verse 20 where it says to the law, the Torah and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. That word light is daybreak. There is no sun rising in them. The law and the testimony. Testimony of what? Let's go to Revelation 6, 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. Okay, so there we got the law and the testimony again. Let's go to Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him. This is the dragon we're going to read a little bit more about um, 
in a moment, they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their soul until death. And I think I forgot to put, um, wait, wait, no, verse 17. Yeah, I think I forgot to put it in there. The dragon was enraged over the woman and went to make war with the rest of her seed who keep the commands of God and have the testimony of Yehoshua Messiah. The law and the testimony. This is the mark. This is the seal. This is the name. And I want to uh, look at a few more verses about how God puts his name on his people. Uh, let's look at Ephesians 1, 7 through 14. I want to just hands. point out. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to point out another um, parallel. I don't think this one was in the verses we threw together, but um, you're talking about the the seal and the word of God on God. these people. And um, previously we mentioned the city. And uh, I think the other parallel is when they were actually in Babylon coming out of Babylon. And in the book of Nehemiah, these priests also get the seal on, on them. And they're responsible for teaching that word of God to the people as they leave Babylon. So uh, there's a couple of places there in Nehemiah where it talks about the seal being on these priests and these priests being sealed oh. and distributing the word to the people. And it's also in the cool. seventh month, which is during atonement and uh, tabernacles as well. Well, that's not coincidence. Right. Thank you. All right, Ephesians uh, 1, 7 through 14. I don't remember exactly what this one says, so we will find out. <laughs> All right. In him we have redemption through his blood, okay, the blood of the Lamb, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he caused to abound toward us in all wisdom and understanding, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, for an administration of the fullness of times, to head up all things in Messiah, both the things in heaven and the things on earth, even in him, in whom we have been chosen to an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will, for us to be the praise of his glory, who previously had trusted in Messiah, in whom you also, hearing the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, in whom also believing you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's the part there. So you heard the word, and then you were sealed with the Holy Spirit who is the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance to the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Okay. And then the uh, place where I was going to take us to before second Kings 21, seven through eight, which talks about this um, condition where Yahovah agrees to place his name upon this city of Jerusalem. Uh, all right, so the context here, just we're not going to get into, but just pay attention to what he says here about placing his name in Jerusalem. And he set a graven image of the Asherah, which he had made in, his, in the house, of which Yahovah had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house, and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not again make the feet of Israel wander anymore out of the land which I gave their fathers, only if they will be careful to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the Torah that my servant Moses commanded them. But they did not listen. And in this instance, it says Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than the nations ever did, whom Yahweh destroyed before the sons of Israel. So now we see how the sons of Israel are being seduced to not keep the commands and the Torah. 
of Yahovah. All right, so I'll place my name there forever as long as you are representing my name. That makes sense. Second Chronicles 6. Hey, Keith's got a quick note. Yeah, I was just going to touch on that. You know, I never put that together. You know how in the past you've talked about how important it is for the king to write a copy of the Torah. And the king has to be probably one of the most obedient followers because look how easy this king led the whole nation astray. Right. This is in regards to Solomon not um, keeping the commands as his father David did. Right. All right, um, there's a few verses here. We're going to hop around a little bit. Verses 5 and 6, it says, From the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I have not chosen any city among all the tribes of Israel to build a house in so that my name might be there. For I have chosen, nor have I chosen any man to be a ruler over my people, Israel. But now I have chosen Jerusalem so that my name might be there. And now I have chosen David to be over my people, Israel. Okay, so this was literally King David at the time, but I want us to think spiritually how Messiah is a, a uh, David is a type for the true king of Israel, Yehoshua Messiah. And we, so we have this, this parallel of the name being placed on Jerusalem and David the king ruling over Israel. Um, verse 16 says, And now, Yahovah, the God of Israel, keep with your servant David, my father, which you have promised him, saying, There shall not fail you a man in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel, only if your sons take heed to their way to walk in my Torah as you have walked before me. So David walked in the Torah. David did what was right in the eyes of Yahovah, and it is expected that the sons of Israel will do the same. Okay, verses 26 and 27. When the heavens shall be shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you, if they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin when you afflict them, remember, confessing his name and denying his name have to do with the things that you do. So confessing your name and turning from your sin then you will hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants and your people Israel when you have taught them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land which you have given to your people for an inheritance. All right, um, so there's forgiveness and rain and blessing for walking in his ways. Let's go over to verse or chapter 7. Verses 13 through 22. It's kind of a redundant uh, message, but I want to make sure we, we're getting it. If I shut up the heavens and there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send a plague among my people, let's just pause a minute. If you don't, Revelation, there's a lot of that going on. There's locusts devouring the land. There's plagues being sent. All these things are for the purpose of what? Repenting bringing his people back to his Torah. He says, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Then uh, now my eyes shall be open and my ears shall be open to the prayer of this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house so that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart shall be there forever. And you, if you will walk before me as, your, as David your father walked and do according to all that I have commanded you and shall observe my statutes and my judgments, then I will make the throne of your kingdom sure as I have covenanted with David your father saying there shall not fail you a man to be a ruler in Israel. But if you turn away, and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you. And if you shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck them up by the roots out of my land, which I have given them. And this house, which I have sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight. 
and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all nations. And this house, which is high, shall be a wonder to everyone who passes by it, so that they shall shudder and say, Why has Yahweh done this to this land and to this house? And it shall be answered, Because they forsook Yahweh, the God of their fathers, who brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, and laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore he has brought all this evil upon so we're talking about his name being placed on the land as well, this land of Jerusalem, but that by their disobedience, the people defiled that land. We'll talk about that again. We, we've talked a little bit about these marks or signs that he gives us. Some of them are, he told us that the lights in the firmaments were for signs for us, the rainbow in, in the sky is a sign for us, the blood of the Passover lamb is a sign, the keeping of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a sign, the keeping of the seventh day Sabbath is a sign, keeping his Torah is a sign, and these are marks that are to be in our forehead and hand, forehead representing thoughts, hand representing deeds. So this is the culmination of his word the things he has told us and given us these are the signs these are the marks these are the things that we need to be meditating on and and thinking about and doing his name is his character and his authority he places his character and his authority upon those who belong to him thus thus those who have his name in the forehead are those who have submitted to his character to his power and to his authority the seal of god is the name of elohim on their foreheads but there is another mark so let's read a little bit more about that other mark the mark of the beast revelation 13 11 through 18 and i think now you're going to see some parallels and i saw another beast coming up out of the earth and it had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. So he may look like a messiah, he may look righteous, but the things that he says are going to reveal his identity, okay? Verse 12, and it exercises all the authority of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and those dwelling in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And it does great wonders so that it makes fire come down from the heaven onto the earth in the sight of men. And it deceives those dwelling on the earth because of the miracles which were given to it to do before the beast, saying to those dwelling on the earth that they should make an image to the beast who had the wound by a sword and lived. And there was given to it to give a spirit to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might both speak and might cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And it causes both great and uh, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads even that not any might buy or sell except those having the mark the name of the beast or the number of its name here is wisdom let him having reason count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man and it is the number 666 this is still very mysterious um not going to try to make heads or tails out of all of it except i want to draw your attention to the fact that there is a mark in the forehead and in the hand, and it is a name, the name of the beast. And the number of its name is 666. We see the six is involved here. Also tells us that it is the number of the beast and it is the number of a man. We can't let that escape our attention. Remember Nebuchadnezzar's image. It had this numbers six involved and it was a statue, an image of a man. The ultimate um, battle, I think, that we're seeing here is, are you going to rely on men for your help, or are you going to trust in God and his words? 
All right. Um, wanted to draw your attention to this word beast for a moment. Um, it is the Greek word therion. And it is, if you look into the Greek Septuagint, remember the Greek Septuagint is the Old Testament um, ancient translation um, in the Greek from the Hebrew. It's one of the oldest translations. And the word beast, as day six man and beast being created, is this word, therion. Here it describes it as a dangerous animal. It's not always, but a wild beast. In this um, connotation, we can say, yeah, it's a dangerous animal. <laughs> but the image of a beast being um, that which Satan is the head of, that old serpent, the devil, the most cunning beast of the field. The first beast uh, representing the kingdoms and ruling authorities of men and this second beast is a dragon. It is the serpent of old who has given authority over these man-made kingdoms. And um, he is this false messiah who looks like the messiah. He looks like a lamb, but he says things. His words will reveal that he is truly the dragon. There's another scripture that says Satan disguises himself as a messenger of light, an angel of light. So he's wearing a disguise, a wolf in sheep's clothing. How will you know who he is? How will you be able to identify him? So he, he's called a dragon here. He has a mouth. He spoke like a dragon. Let's go back to Revelation 12:3. We're, we're trying to identify him. Revelation is kind of like a big puzzle. You just got to kind of put these pieces together and you can see how they fit together. Another sign was seen in the heavens and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and ca excuse me, cast them into the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman being about to bear, so that when she bears, she might devour her child. Um, okay, so this is a dragon that wants to devour the child, and this child being a um, son, a male, who's going to rule the nations. Um, let's skip down to verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast into the earth and his angels were cast with him. So now we know who he is. Verse 15. You know, what is he doing? He's trying to overcome God's people. He's trying to destroy the, the Messiah. And here it says the serpent, which is the same, the dragon. The serpent cast out of his mouth water like a flood after the woman so that he might cause her to be carried away by the river. All right, so what I wanted to make note of here is that there's water being sent to overtake the woman. And I'm going to propose to you, just to bear with me, that this woman is a representation of God's people, Israel. Um, I think there are several um, meanings to this parable, not just one, but this is one I'm referring to right now. So that water is being sent out of the mouth of this serpent, out of the mouth of this dragon, for the purpose of overtaking her. And recall that the Torah and our father of our father is comes forth from his mouth, and it is like heavenly waters that come down from above and give give us life. But here we see another water that comes out of the mouth of a dragon, and it brings death. Um, I don't think I included this scripture, but the, Paul talks about not being overtaken, being tossed to and fro like the waves of the sea by every strange doctrine. So I think that's what this is. This is doctrine that is not of God. 
So let's pause again for a moment and talk about how life and death are in the power of the tongue. God's word is life. Satan's word, death. Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it shall eat the fruit of it. So do you love life or do you love death? What does this mean? Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 20. For this commandment, which I command you today, is not hidden from you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who shall go up to us, go up for us to heaven and bring it to us so that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who shall go over the sea for us to the region beyond the sea and bring it to us so that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart so that you may do it. Behold, I have set before you today life and good and death and evil. In that I command you today to love Yahovah your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments so that you may live and multiply. And Yahovah your God shall bless you in the land where you go to possess it. But if you turn away your heart so that you will not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land where you pass over the Jordan to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record as witnesses today against you. I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life so that both you and your seed may live, so that you may love Yahovah your God and that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, so that you may dwell in the land which Yahovah swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give it to them. These marks or seals are placed in the forehead and hand, like we said, representing our thoughts and our deeds or our actions. And this is part of that wrestling at that soul level. What we give place to in our hearts and minds will manifest itself in our actions. Every action, whether good or evil, was first a thought. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. This is teaching us that we must rule over our thoughts. For though walking about in flesh, we do not war according to flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, pulling down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience of Messiah and having readiness to avenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Taking your thoughts captive, giving them over to the word of God, to obedience of Messiah. Um, this is a, yeah, we do have it. Um, so we want to rule over the carnal or flesh nature by the spirit that God has given to us. Ephesians 4, 13 through 27. Thirteen through twenty-seven, and this until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to grow to a full-grown man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Messiah, so that we may no longer be infants. Oh, here we go, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, in the dishonesty of men, in cunning craftiness, to the wiles of deceit but that you speaking the truth in love may in all things grow up to him who is the head, even Messiah, from whom the whole body fitted together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of each part, producing the growth of the body to the edifying of itself in love. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you should not walk from now on as other nations walk in the vanity, vain 
the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. For they, being past feeling, have given themselves up to lust, to all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Messiah, if indeed you have heard him and were taught by him, as the truth is in Yehoshua. For you ought to put off the old man according to the way of living before, who is corrupt, according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And you should put on the new man, who according to God was created in righteousness and true holiness, therefore putting away lying, let each man speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. So now we see who we are actually giving place to when we give over to these lusts of the flesh, when we turn from keeping God's words and turn toward keeping the words of another, we are giving place to the devil in our soul. Again, every action, whether good or evil, was first a thought. Genesis 4, 6 through 8, this is where God warned Cain of this very thing. Cain thought evil in his heart against his brother, and then he acted upon it. He didn't rule over that thought. He didn't take that thought captive. He took on the mark of a brute beast. Yahweh said to Cain, why have you, has your anger glowed and why did your face fall? If you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin crouches at the door. Its desire is for you and you shall rule over it. So that's like Satan, that sin, that serpent. He's just waiting, sitting there at the door of your heart, waiting for you to let him in, to give him a foothold. And Cain talked with his brother Abel, and it happened when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So he gave in to the image of the beast. We'll go much further into that when we get into this chapter. So now we can see that this mark on the forehead and hand is a sign that reveals who we are truly serving. I'm not going to say that it's not some kind of physical mark of the beast. I'm not going to go there. I'm just saying it is clearly spiritual. There's clearly a spiritual application to it. In Revelation 17, we learn more about this beast and a woman and a mark in the forehead. And one of the seven angels who had the seven vials came and talked with me saying, come here and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot sitting on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and became drunk with the wine of her fornication, those inhabiting the earth. And he carried, away, carried me away into a desert by the spirit. So we're seeing a spiritual vision. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet colored beast. Remember, red dragon that was associated with the beast. So now we can get an idea of who's she sitting on. And this, she's sitting on this scarlet colored beast filled with names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and she was gilded with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Yehoshua. And when I saw her, I marveled with a great marveling. And the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, that has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not, and is about to ascend out of the abyss and go into perdition. I just want to pause a minute. What do we know about Elohim and Messiah and the truth? It was and it is, and it is coming. It always has been. It always will be. What do we know about this beast? 
it sounds like some kind of counterfeit. He was and is not and is about to come. I thought that was an interesting parallel. And those dwelling on the earth will marvel those whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Can you scroll, but I can't see. And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and there are seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and he is of the seven and goes into perdition. We're not going to go into any of this. I'm just reading through it. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom yet, but will receive authority as kings one hour with the beast. So the beast is giving men authority, okay? And these have one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. What did we say about the name of God? It is his character. It is his power. It is his authority in the foreheads of the people who serve him. So we have given over to his power, to his authority, and we can see here that these individuals have one mind as well, but they're giving their power and authority over to the name of another, to the beast. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And those with him are called, are the called and elect and faithful ones. And he says to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw in the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God gave it into her, their hearts to do his mind and to act with one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is the great city which has a kingdom over the kings of the earth. All right, so I wanted to just pull this out. This woman, she says she's got this mystery Babylon, got that name, mother of harlots, and she is a great city. Where was the name of Yahovah placed? Let's go to Jeremiah 3, 1 through 3. Remember, it was placed in a city called Jerusalem, according to the flesh. But what happens when you take his name in vain? Jeremiah 3, 1 through 3. They say, if a man puts away his wife and she goes from him and will be for another man, will he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly defiled? But you play the harlot with many lovers. Yet come back to me, says Yehovah. Lift up your eyes to the high places and see. Where you have not, where have you not been laid with, committing adultery? By the highways you have sat for them, like the Arabian in the wilderness, and you have defiled the land with your fornications and with your wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withheld. So there's this rain being withheld, and there has been no latter rain, and you had a harlot's forehead. You refused to be ashamed. All right. So God's people defile the land. The land is defiled under its inhabitants because they have forsaken God's ways. This is confirmed in Isaiah 24, verse 5. Isaiah 24, verse 5. The land is defiled under its people because they have transgressed the laws, the Torah, changed the ordinance, and have broken the everlasting covenant. Right? Now, Scripture reveals there is a new Jerusalem, and this parallels this whole idea of you needing to be reborn, regenerated from above, through the Spirit, through the Messiah. And let's look at Revelation uh, let's see. 
we read already in Revelation 3, we're not going to look at it again, but just how um, Messiah says, if you overcome, I'm going to write the name of the new Jerusalem. Actually, it's right here. I'm going to write upon you the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. But yet we have this harlot, this woman playing a harlot with the name of harlotry written on her forehead. That implies you once were Yahovah's. But then you will listen to the voice of another, and you played the harlot. And now you've got another name written in your forehead, Babylon, confusion by mixing. Okay, um, we must overcome this beast image. And we know that he tempted uh, Adam and Eve in the garden to be like Elohim. That was how he did it. There's only one way to be like Elohim, and that is to hear his voice, follow the Messiah wherever he goes, and do what he says. Uh, I want to look at Revelation 15, too. I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. So the idea being we need to have victory over the image of the beast, victory over his mark. Psalm 73, sin is what caused us to take on that image, but because Yehoshua overcame, we can overcome. Uh, let's look through 20 through 28. The psalm says, Like a dream when one awakens, so, O Yahovah, when you awake, you shall despise their image. For my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and I did not know. I was like a beast before you. But I am always with you. You have held me by my right hand. You shall lead me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven? And beside you I desire none in the earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, those who are far from you shall perish, who have destroyed all who go lusting away from you. You have destroyed. And I, it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in Yehovah Elohim to declare all of your works. No longer are we called forsaken. We are no longer in the image of a brute beast. We talked a little bit about this. Let's head over to Second Peter. I'm almost done. Second Peter 2, 9 through 16, where he makes reference to this brute beast. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust for a day of judgment, to be punished, and especially those who walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise dominion. They are darers, self-pleasing, not trembling at glories, speaking evil, where angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reproaching accusation against them before the Lord. But these as unreasoning, natural, brute animals or beasts have been born for capture and corruption, speak evil of the things they do not understand, and they will utterly perish in their own corruption. Being about to receive the wages of unrighteousness, deeming indulgence as pleasure in the daytime and reviling in spots and blemishes, feasting along with you in their deceits, having eyes full of adultery and never ceasing from sin, alluring unstable souls, having a heart exercised with covetousness. They are cursed children who have forsaken the right way and have gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but had reproof of his law-breaking, a dumb ass, a beast, speaking in a man's voice, held back the man madness of the prophet. So God even used a beast to correct an ignorant individual who is acting like a beast. Looking at that word brute beast, um, 
verse 12, I believe. May have mentioned this a couple times uh, before. That word brute is a logos. The word logos in Greek is word or words, as in the word of God. If you put an A in front of something in Greek, it gives it a negative particle. So meaning literally without words. So you, a brute beast is a beast without words. Spiritually speaking, a beast without the words of God. Um, and now we see that um, there's two marks. There's two individuals, if you will, and you are serving whoever's mark you've taken on. And I want to just end here with um, Revelation 22 or 23. I forgot to put it in my notes. So you just go over to try 23. Nope. 21, Revelation 21. Thank you. So this is the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away and the sea no longer is. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no mourning, nor crying, nor will there be any more pain for the first things that passed away. He sitting on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. To him who thirsts, I will give the fountain of the water of life freely. He who overcomes will inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars will have their part in the lake burning with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Um, that's about all I have. I just wanted to, um, check my note here that, okay, so to be without God's words as a brute beast, we know that Satan is called the lawless one. And if his mark is a, a counterfeit of Yahovah's mark, then, and Yahovah's mark is his words and keeping his words then Satan and his mark, their MO is going to be to convince you to do the opposite. His words will say, you don't have to keep the law of God. You don't have to keep the Sabbath. You don't have to keep the feast days. These are things that he is going to try to tempt you with and beguile you with. But ours is to say, but what did God say? Is it in his word? Does anybody have anything they want to add? Yeah, I thought it was uh, I thought it was awesome all of the parallels you brought out and you mentioned here at the end you, you know a um, uh, these two counterparts in in the word and in people, but you also through a lot of these verses were talking about cities and temples and consequences of moving away from god's word and what happens when you know when you went through second chronicles and it was talking about the temple and him putting his name on that temple and when people turned away from him that he would be remo removing himself and people would look at that temple and in astonishment and and then you brought out some of those same parallels in revelation about that city and this beast and the amazement that people were looking at this, you know, fake counterfeit of, of something here. Right. And, you know, when we, when we look at what the, what the Bible says about him placing his name on the, the temple and him 
removing himself when we deviate from his word, what is his temple today? Well, it's, it's us, right? Uh, we are all um, part of the body that builds this temple out. And I think it's important to um, understand that the things that you're bringing to light isn't just at an individual level, but it's also at a corporate level for the body. It, I was in a class at work a couple of weeks ago called uh, Change Management. And they were talking about how you get change done at a corporate level. And it's always at the individual that you have to invoke at the individual level a reason for why that change is important and what a person may get out of it. And once they buy into that, it's easier to make changes more unified at, as a, at, at that corporate level. And uh, I think it's um, important to think about that as we go out and minister to folks, right? Um, what is it that we're doing at, at an individual level with people? Because all of these individuals that are believers are making up the body. How are we getting them drawn back to the word so that the name is written on them so that this temple that we're we're building for him um has his name and he and he dwells within it right and i think that's uh an important thing to think about as we spread this gospel as we disciple each other as we go out into the world and and, and try to share his word and and the light of his word um it's it's what will unify us and keep us from taking that wrong mark, right? Right. And in Matthew 5, I think we may have spoken about it, as Messiah compares us to a city set on a hill. And let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So it's this idea of you being like this city, this renewed Jerusalem where he can place his name and that where you can go out and do his will for the benefit of the nations to draw them toward God. Did anyone else have anything? I thought maybe Keith came off mute for a minute. No, I, I'm, I'm good. But yeah, you bring up a good point as far as defining and being able to understand what we're up against and what is the mark of the beast versus Yahuwah's mark. If you just think you're going to wait around for them to put a, a chip in you or something like that, it's, it's more worship related. It's something to do with following our father's commandments more than man, men's technology. And, uh, yes. And that's where, that's where you have to really place your understanding is what we're up against and what does the word say. So I really and, appreciate you digging deeper into that and showing the scriptures that are related to that. And Keith, you bring up a good point, right? Yeshua says you can't serve two masters, right? Right. So if, you, if you're concerning yourself with the mark of God, you don't need to be worried about the mark of the beast. You've already chosen the master that you're going to follow. Good point. Yeah. All right. Well, I can. Matt, did uh, you have something? Uh, I do. Um, thank you. Uh, this was the, this is so much, so, <laughs> so much information, and it was so good, and and I just uh, I just kept going back to, you know, how um, the Israelites went out every day to collect the bread. And, um, and then on, on, um, and then, to, and, and then uh, the day before the Sabbath, they had to have enough for, for the Sabbath day. And, and I guess I, I've, I've always thought, um, that I I had forgotten and not put together that 
it wasn't like they didn't have other things to eat. They brought cattle with them. They brought, they had um, the quail. They had, they had things. They, but yet the bread was so important and um, was so, so needed. And um, it's uh, it, even today, you know, I, I just, I think about the prayer, give us this day our daily bread that is what i need and um and and if we're not careful you know some of this while you were talking i i i had a heaviness in thinking lord i want to just uh i know i have your mark but i i want to just be so uh ready and um and not be confused uh during this time you know what i mean uh just uh just know uh who is who and and uh in second peter uh chapter 2 verse 9 i was so happy then uh <laughs> that the lord gave you the scripture too the lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and 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 that just meant so much to me. And and then I just kind of calmed down and settled down. And I thought, Lord, you got this for me too. And I just had to say that. I I'm I'm just so appreciative that the Lord will guide and direct us and and He's so good. Yes. And and, and the more you equip yourself with this word, the less fear you will have. Like you don't have to be afraid. He's he you are his he has yeah. marked you no one can hurt you no one can can curse you no one can curse what god has blessed and when you talk about that gathering the manna messiah taught us what that truly meant when he said i am the bread that came from heaven and yes. unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you have no life in you and he is the word of god so we must hear those words from our teacher it all comes back to that, that give us this day our daily bread. We have six days, six spiritual days. Every person coming into the earth has a lifetime that they can choose to live for themselves and make a name for themselves, which is the Babylon mentality. That's what they were doing in Babylon. To, they're trying to seeking to make a name for themselves. Or you can use this life, this one life, that God has given to you to seek to make a name for him in the earth. And that is the true test. Whoever loves their life will lose it, but whoever seeks to lose their life for his sake will find it. Ella? And real quick before Ella jumps in, um, just going back to what my mom was saying, in Second Thessalonians, it talks about this lawless one that, that uh, is going to be revealed. And what it says here is that, and with all deceit of unrighteousness and those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And I think the key here is they didn't receive a love for the truth. And we know that the folks here paying attention to this study, that's uh, looking at the word of God and loving his word and his truth, this delusion, this deception is not going to be applied for them because we have received a love for the truth. Sorry, go ahead, Ella. Oh, that's okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, it's very delayed. Um, what you were saying it just kind of reminded me of what you were saying earlier it's not like it this isn't an insight it was just me not really putting two and two together i guess um when you're talking about you were saying the 144,000 were the first fruits and you said that's not all of people who are going to be saved it was just the first fruits i guess i just never thought that before like i never really thought too hard about that uh I don't know what you were saying earlier, just reminded me of that. And it's just, 
I guess I thought it was just the 144,000. But well, it appears that way. Know. That's it's so interesting about Revelation is that it is like a big puzzle. You can read this piece, and if you just focus on this piece, you're probably not getting the full picture. And then you're going to start making your own conclusions. But we are firm believers of allowing Scripture to interpret Scripture. And when you do that, you're letting God tell you what it means. You don't have to wonder. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Probably kept you long enough here. Okay. All right. I'll pray. Father Yahovah, thank you for this study today. It was a blessing to all of us. We pray that uh, this word would take root in our heart and that your name would be written on us and that we would have a safe week and come back next Shabbat to worship and serve you. In Yahushua's name, amen. Shabbat shalom. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.